tell you that I did, uh, I did the planes of the head. I've done a demo for you guys um, today that's about 30 minutes long and it just basically helps us get started. It'll be the last project that we do today. Um, but it, it's probably one that you'll continue on after class. It, this is a hard exercise, the planes of the head, if you've done it before. And if you've done it before, if you've done it two times or five times, every time you do it, it, it helps. It's a very helpful exercise. So I have one that I did a long time ago in acrylic paint. I did it real quick for a workshop the night before, believe it or not. I don't know how quick I was, but I want to tell you that it was easier in paint than it was in charcoal and pastel. Um, it, it may have been because the paper I was using had lots of tooth in it, was real textural. It was just Strathmore paper. And I had, I don't have a very good drawing at the end of my demo to show you. I mean, it's fairly accurate, but I, uh, the values are not that great. So you may want to choose, let me go ahead and share the screen. Um, I, I'd love for you to have your sketchbook today and those magazine, if you have any magazine pictures or I sent you some, pictures of faces that you could print and do these exercises on. I'm also going to try to do the exercises in Photoshop and show you how I would divide that particular face into planes. Um, it's a really, really good exercise and I, I, I want, I think it'll be very beneficial to you no matter what you're painting, even if you're not a, a, a big portrait fan. But you may want to try this on a canvas paper or canvas board with some acrylic paint or oil. But acrylic was a little easier. Um, you just have to go ahead and mix up four or five values of black and white in acrylic and have they kind of spray them with a spray bottle or something so they don't dry too quick. Put some flow aid or retarder or something in it. Um, a value scale would be helpful if you have one of those. You don't have to have one, but it's a great thing. Even if you don't feel like doing the planes of the head today and you just want to paint or draw a little 10 value value scale. Um, if, if you wanna do that, I just wanna give you some options today because really this planes of the head is to familiarize you with all the planes and, and help you learn to see that way instead of flat. So I'll have some great examples to show you. If you've done, and I know some of you have done portrait classes with me before and you, these are things you already know, but they're are some new images I'm excited to show you and some great things that will remind you and help um, plant these things in your um, skills, in your tool bag. So, and I believe that um, as long as you don't have some grand idea that the, the planes is gonna look like a masterpiece when you're finished, um, go into it knowing that it's an exercise. Can Purely, I say something? Yes. Please do, Denise. Go ahead and then you, Jackie, after Denise. Please expect it to look awful. That's just how it is. Okay. I mean, don't be disappointed. I still can't do it. <laughs> and I bought one. He, he's sitting right over here looking at me, but I just, I know that it can be discouraging, but just accept the fact that, I don't know, somebody may turn out something beautiful, but... <laughs> For those of us that don't, it's it's, not, it's, it's just that way. But every time hard. you do it, it really helps you do it better the next time. Yes, I sent pictures this week yeah. in my email of different uh, positions for that planes of the head. Um, and I'm just right. tell, telling you, it's purely an exercise today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you want to do it in pencil and charcoal, be sure to have three values at least, if not five. Um, you'll use the different pressures for the pencil. The pencil is a little bit messier than if you wanted to use acrylic or uh, you could use oil as well. You're going to need to mix up five values at least. Uh, five values would be fine to do the planes of the head. Uh, but don't, like Denise said, don't expect it to be a wonderful masterpiece um, because it's, it's a challenge. And I did have one of my young teenage students and she worked on it like three weeks in class. That's three, three hour classes, but she did a beautiful job of that planes of the head. And that's probably the first time I've seen somebody knock it out of the park like that. But um, it's, it's a challenge, but I want to tell you, it's one of the most beneficial exercises that you'll do. 
Uh, it really right. makes you slow right. down and look at the, and not create a flat looking face because that's the that's the thing. You get that thing drawn, you make it look like the person, but then when you go to start adding color and value, it it all ends up being this one middle tone value and everything looks very flat. So I'm excited again, but I wanted okay. to make sure that you had all the materials and whichever one you feel most comfortable with, it's fine to use a like I said, pastel. It's helpful if you have a gray tone paper or a gray tone canvas, but it, you don't have to. Have Use whatever you have um, and make sure you try to have, if you're using the pencils, you have black and white. If you have some gray shades of pastel pencils, that was very helpful. So you might want to go ahead and pull those out as we get started. And if you're using paint, go ahead. When we get to that stage, you'll want to mix up five values of between black and white. Uh, any other questions okay. about materials this morning? Uh, the first exercises we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be in your sketchbook and on the magazine pictures of faces. Um, so if you were able to print some off or if you have any magazine pictures, um, and if not, it's fine. You can do that later or you can just watch. I'm gonna try to do some uh, samples in Photoshop of how I would divide a face into planes. Um, so, <clears throat> Christy, you did. yes, Christy, uh -huh. I want to ask you a question. I have these pastels that has the different grays. Is that that's would perfect? That work that's would perfect. Be? Yes, and you'll want okay. to have if you're going to be using charcoal or pastels, you'll want to have a blending tortillon. Uh, something right. to blend with and a good eraser. I would I would suggest the little mono zero eraser if you have that. Hey, Carla. Um, or um, any kind of eraser, you know, a small one if you have it to do some details in there and a kneaded eraser. Yeah, that'll work. You can use the corners of that if you don't have a, um, yeah, that'll be fine. So I wanted to make sure everybody had their materials that wanted to. And listen, if you just want to, observe today that is also fine just soak right. some in head so i'm excited again to get into this um, lesson with you uh, let me start off um, with a quote out of helen van wyke's book she is one of my favorite teachers of all time and if you're new and you haven't heard of helen and if you've been with me very long you know i talk about her a lot um, i watched her in the 80s she was on PBS every Saturday morning for years and um, the best art teacher I've ever seen. She covers everything. She does it in 30 minutes, 27 minutes. She's funny. She's humorous. She loves what she did and she's passed away now, but she um, talks about um, her teacher, Maximilian Rasko. Uh, I believe he was Hungarian and um, somebody asked Helen, your, your mentor was, he was a portrait painter. And she said, oh, he was much more than that. He was a teacher. And I mean, a real teacher, the sort whose every waking moment is devoted to showing you the way. One time he went out and he bought a big bag of apples. He poured them out on the table and he told me now spend the day painting these apples. So I did, as I was told when the painting was completed, he went over and put the apples back into the bag. And he brought me the bag of apples and said, now I want you to pull out each apple and tell me which one is which in your painting. Mm -hmm. It was a tough lesson in the difference between knowing as we all do that no two apples are alike and actually painting them so that you could tell them apart. Um, and I think, you know, there, we could do exercises for the rest of our lives um, and learn and learn and learn. But um, an apple is a fabulous thing. Carla started her 40 apples uh, a few years ago when we were in class and we started painting an apple together. Um, you know, and the reason why apples are so helpful is that the head, everything about the head is spherical, pretty much. You know, the lips have circles, the nose. We're going to see that when we start working on the, on the features, the ears. There's circles everywhere. There's spherical shapes in a lot of what we paint. And so when you paint an apple, it's a really good uh, uh, foundation for learning to paint the head. Another little bit of wisdom from Helen, and she said after a morning's demonstration, uh, one of her students said, boy, you really put everything into painting. Um, you finished with your 
hands and arms covered in pain. It's on your blouse. It's on the floor. You really get into it was the student's observation. And Helen says, well, that's the essence of most artists' problems with painting, you know, timidity. You can't be timid. Uh, don't be in awe of painting. Don't be afraid of the process. Grab it with gusto and beat the crap out of it. Um, and I mean, that was just her her um, attitude about it. And she gave you the courage to go, hey, you can do this. And she just, you know, she slapped it on there. She used her brush like a big spoon. She had skill behind that tenacity and behind that joy of what she was doing. And she, we, I watched her, you see, she looks like she's got a wig on in one of these pictures. I watched her through her battle with cancer back in the eighties and she painted, she, you could tell she lost all her hair. She got gaunt and, and thin. She kept doing welcome to my studio shows every week. And I would venture to say that she probably painted until the very end. So I love that kind of uh, spirit. And I believe that can be our inspiration for this morning is just what you love, just do it with all your heart. Don't let anything stop you from doing it. It's just such a joy and such a blessing that God has given us. Um, here's another little bit of wisdom about the head from John Singer Sargent. And I know this is kind of creepy there, the guy without the eyes. Um, but Sargent's quote says, if you work on a head for a week without indicating the features, you will have learnt, I don't know about that word, but you have learnt something about modeling of the head, the modeling of the head. And I think um, a couple of artists have done some exercises where they blurred out sergeants, the eyes in sergeants' paintings. And you can see that they're so strong and so realistic, even without the eyes, because the eyes are kind of what make, you know, the windows of the soul, they're kind of what makes the painting. So if you can really, um, Helen also talks about when you paint an apple, hold an apple in your hand, take a bite out of it. Think about the roundness of it, the dimension of it. And so I believe that that's really key and important when you're painting the head because, you know, how many inches is a head? It's probably, you know, I don't know, six or eight inches in depth. And so we, we're, we're painting and um, showing the tip of the nose and I've heard teachers say, think about the back of the head while you're painting the tip of the nose and think about that, that amount of space uh, and not just a flat surface. Um, so again, going back to the apples, why paint apples? And you see these are some um, still life paintings. Um, that spherical shape is everywhere, everywhere. And one of the things that I've been cautioned about by several teachers is don't get distracted by 20,000 details before you get the solid sphere with its values in place. Uh, because a lot of times we just, we get, you know, a contour drawn and we jump right into the features and we don't really think about all the, how the light's hitting that big round surface. So be mindful of that. Um, don't get distracted by details too early on. That, that goes for everything you paint. You know how on all the demos we've done this year, we've started with simple shapes, circles, triangles, cubes. We've gone into block in and then we've, you know, blocked it in quickly and loosely. And then we've slowly added value and detail. And it's the same with the head. Be careful about getting too detailed too quickly. So this is a page in the Pinterest, on my Pinterest page, or just one that I found on instruction for painting the head. And I want to tell you, there's a million ways to go about it. There's all kinds of instruction out there about how to paint a head. Um, you, can, you, you can find, you see over here on this left side, Andrew Loomis was a wonderful teacher in the 50s and 60s. And you can still find his books um, I have a couple of PDFs that were online for free. They were in the public domain. So I'll, I'll try to attach some of those in my recap. But it, they're wonderful books with full of instruction. You can see a page here on the far left out of Andrew Loomis's book. Um, the second one is looks like anime. You know, the kids would go for that. Uh, 
putting a box over the head, and we're going to talk about that. Using the planes of the head, a magazine picture, we're going to also talk about that. And all, and my, my most um, tried and true is my instruction from Daniel Green, which is simply working on the head like a window shade being pulled down and then working from the inside out in small increments. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be showing you and teaching you today. So what I, I always say this in classes, but what I teach is just one way, or I always try to include several different um, varieties, but find what works for you and use that. I'm not saying you need to do it the way that I do it. It's just one way. Um, these are some images in my worksheets and I'll tell you my website is down today. Um, I, I've got to call the domain host thing today because something's wrong with the connection, but I do have all these worksheets on my website under educational, just hit the educational button and it will drop down and all of my worksheets are on there. So these images are the ones that I've used the most. Um, these involve where the features are placed on the head. We're not focusing on features today. We're, we're mostly focusing on the, the, the head itself, the depth and width and height and the planes within the head, um, shape, value, and planes. Next week, we'll start and we're going to take several features a week and we're going to go over those in depth. And I'm going to show you some good tips for those. I'm going fast. Any any questions or observations at this point? Okay, I'm going to get to exercise real quick because I know y'all will be asleep in a minute if I don't. Um, this is a worksheet that my teacher Shirley um, gave us years and years ago, maybe 25 years ago. And in this worksheet, she talks about your light source. So while this is just a flat profile of a child's face, She's made a couple of observations. Children's heads are large, usually. Their features are typically, the, one of the best things she taught me was that a baby's features are down in the lower third of the face. So a lot of times you'll go to draw a baby or a young child and you'll go, well, I've, I've drawn all the features exactly right, but it looks older, it looks older. And that is almost always because you don't have the features squished down into the lower portion of the face. Their heads are large. And as they grow, if you can see my image right now, the features as they grow, go up and up and up until as an adult or a, an older teenager, the eyes are halfway down the skull. So we're gonna learn that more when we talk about the eyes, but that's an important thing uh, uh, as far as babies, because I don't know about you, but I've seen some creepy looking baby portraits and I've done some creepy babies myself. Um, so just know that they've got big heads and I've tried to um, measure babies heads are smaller than adults heads. So you'll have to, you know, if you're doing a whole uh, like a family, you've got to compare in real life, not necessarily in your photo. You've got to compare how big that baby's head is compared to the parent's head. Because if you get the heads all the same size, it's going to look real creepy too. So so size is an important consideration. Here's another, this is in the worksheet, um, worksheets that I'll send you. Um, you see how the baby's eyes are much lower than the halfway mark. So that's just a good illustration. You can see that the ear begins about halfway back on the head, which is a common, the baby's head stick out. Our little Devin's head was so big he would lean over the pool and I just knew he would throw stuff in all the time. And I just knew that big old head was going to take him over one day. And it sure enough, it did when he was about five and he learned to swim real quick. Um, another consideration is the tilt of the head. So it, if you don't think about these things in the very beginning, you're going to work yourself to death because we, we naturally want to put, everything um, smack dab in the middle of the page or the canvas. Then we want to put, even if you know there's a tilt and I try to put a cross in the middle and we'll talk about that next week when we start on the features. But even if you know that and you put your cross in at an angle, when you start to draw, you your brain will automatically 
level it out because we just, we, our brains like to be balanced. So you'll find that you'll start pulling that eye up and those features up and pretty soon they'll be straight across. So that's, I'll put this big cross in the very beginning of my head to make myself remember that all the features are going to go on perpendicular to that angle and that tilt of the head. Um, so that's another important consideration. So um, I didn't pull this up yet and I meant to. I want to show you a little video clip. Um, and this is one of my favorite um, YouTube guys, Stan Prokopinko. I'm going to be doing a series of video tutorials on drawing the head from various angles. Hopefully there will be some interest and I can continue making more of these for you guys. In this first video, I'm going to attempt to summarize and simplify Andrew Loomis' approach to drawing the head. Here we go. If we remove the ear, lips, eyes, and nose from the head, we're left with two simple masses. The first is a ball for the cranium, and the second is a boxy shape for the jaw. The cranium is spherical, but with the sides flattened, so chopping off a slice from both sides of that ball gets us a simplified but close representation of the cranial mass. When drawing the head, I'll start with the circle for the ball. And after a few failed attempts, rip out your hair, take a deep breath, and try again. But seriously, make sure that it looks like a circle and at least the height and width are the same. The oval is a bit more tricky. The height will always be the same no matter what angle you're drawing the head from. It's two-thirds the height of the circle. So I'll usually look at the area from the center of the circle to the top and divide that into thirds. And the top third will be where the oval begins. And the same for the bottom. The width of the oval depends on the direction the person is looking. Compare the width of the front plane to the width of the side plane. The top portion of the oval falls on the corner of the forehead. This is where the front plane meets the side plane. This area is usually rounded, so it's open to the artist's interpretation. But I've found that it usually lies near the end of the eyebrow. So as I just showed, we indicate the left and right turn of the head by the width of the oval. Now we need to find the up and down tilt. This is indicated by an angle along the side plane. If the head is tilted up, the angle will point up, and if the head is tilted down, the angle will point down. The degree of the tilt will determine how steep to make this line. I like to use the angle from the ear to the brow. From there, I'll continue that line over to the front plane, and since this line represents the brow, pay attention to the angle from one brow to the other. Then draw a curve parallel to the first one, this time starting from the bottom of the oval. This represents the bottom of the nose. Drawing the same line again from the top of the oval would bring you to the hairline. Now since the face can be broken down into nearly perfect thirds, from chin to nose to brow to hair, we can use the measurements we already found to find the length down to the chin. Observe the general shape of the jaw and draw on the major angles starting from the brow, coming down to the chin, and going around to the side plane of the head. It's usually about halfway into the oval, or a little bit further back. We've already found the side plane of the cranium, now we need to do the same thing with the cheek and jaw area. There's a rhythm that starts at the top of the ear and curves down to the outside of the chin. Then find the center line of the face. Remember, this is the center of the front plane, not the center of the whole head width. And finish with the neck. Now that we have the foundation of the head established, we can finish it by putting in all the features. Eyes, nose, lips, ear, hair, jaw, cheeks, chin. Don't worry, I'll explain this step in more detail in another video. Each feature deserves its own tutorial. This approach is really good to establish the perspective of the head. A good exercise is to try to think about the head as a simple, elongated box. The angles on the front plane of the face, such as hairline, brow line, nostrils, lips, and chin, will be the same as the angles on the front plane of the box. The angle from the brow line to the ear is the same as the angle on the side plane of the box. These angles are really important because they establish the head as a three-dimensional form in space. Let's go through that one more time. Start with a circle for the cranium, oval for the side plane of the head, angle to show the person is looking up or down, draw an identical curve to find the nose, 
and double that distance to find the chin. Attach the jaw and you have a three-dimensional representation of the head, ready for the features. At first, this approach might seem a bit technical, with a lot of important details to remember, but once you get the hang of it, it actually becomes really easy. So get that sketchbook out and practice this a hundred times with various angles. That is one, um, one way to think about the, the head, the planes of the head. And I want to always like to introduce to you different ways and different uh, types of, of um, methods. Um, hold on, I lost my PowerPoint. There we go. Um, <clears throat> it, it feels, I, I haven't really done a head this way. Um, it, it's helpful though for me to look at it this way and think about the roundness of the skull and that box of the chin and how it's, a, it's sort of a box that's, that's placed on the bottom. Because what happens is we forget, we forget about how the back of the skull um, extends out beyond, especially when you're doing a profile. And almost every time when I go around the room and help people with their, their portraits, uh, especially if it's a three quarter or a profile view, they never make the head big enough. Um, so sometimes the hair is too big, but you have to, even if you're doing a bunch of intricate hair, you have to think about what the skull looks like underneath that hair and the, the anatomy. Um, Igor Babalov, some of you I know have done some workshops with him and he talks about keeping um, an anatomy book open in your studio or in your space and just looking at it often and understanding the bone structure, understanding the muscles. The more that you understand, the better you're going to be able to um, replicate the human. Um, and again, the human face, the human body is God's most complex creation. <laughs> so it's one of the most difficult things to do. If you can do that, you can do anything. Uh, Jackie asked me about this link, and I'm going to send you the links to everything in the recap for today's class. So uh, Proco has hundreds of videos, and you will love, you can just sit down and watch, and he's a nut, but he's cute, so you don't mind him being so silly. Um, he's a wonderful teacher, and listen, I think he's one of the first self-made millionaires from YouTubers, from YouTubing, and but he gives away a ton, ton of information, so um, here's another, and this little segment, get your sketchbooks out because I like for us to do um, the sphere and the box uh, exercise. Um, and you, you note, you can look at the human skull here and you can kind of see what Proko was talking about. You can see where the bone structure, the zygomatic arch right here, that's probably one of the only bones in the glabella that I know. But if you learn one or two little things about the skull, you'll always think about that. So when we're working on a face, the face, the front plane stops about right here at the end of your eyebrows. So, you know, you need to know that you need to know that you're fixing to turn a corner right here. And the way I've got light coming from both sides, so you can't tell on me, but you need to know that the, the, the value and the way you paint and draw has to change right here. Um, and you'll see, as I do the demo of the planes of the head, how, I start right in the middle. I have to correct myself and I left it on there so that you could see. Um, here's, here are some, is one image of an anatomy of the skull. Um, and these are the different points. Um, the, the glabella, like I said, is the only one I really know, which is right here. And it's where it changes direction right here. If you make it flat from the hairline to the tip of the nose, there's all kinds of different things going on down this ridge and it's changing direction. So, you, you know, learning as much as you can um, in that aspect is going to be important. Uh, I promise we're getting to the box here in just a second. Um, another thing about the measurements, you heard him talk about the thirds from the chin to the nose, from the nose to the brows, from the brows to the hairline. Um, you see the thirds in this image. And you can also use a standard, like in this one, they've, they've used three noses or they've used three ears. And there's one ear between the eye and the front of the ear. The head is three ears wide. So, you know, most of you that have studied with me know that that's what I do. I find a standard. If it's a figure, I see how many heads tall they are and how many heads wide they are. 
on a head, you can use an ear. You can use one of these thirds and you can see how many of those thirds you can find all over the head to get an accurate, to check yourself and get an accurate drawing. <clears throat> so I feel like this is um, comparing size spaces and segments helps you correct yourself, learning to compare things. Um, so that's the primary way that I teach. So now we have a, a good feeling of the spherical shape of the head as a ball and as a box. Um, I, I want to switch a little bit and go to thinking about the head like a cube. We know the head is not square, but, but for um, determining the front, the top, and the side, it helps to put a box down over the top of the head. Um, you can also do, this is out of one of my um, art books. I have to find the book. I think it's um, Drawing the Head by Sandin, John Howard Sandin, um, putting a bucket over the head, imagining a bucket. And that that is very helpful to me so that if the head is tilted forward, <clears throat> excuse me, you see that the, the features are scooped downward. They are not straight. If a head is tilted backwards, then the features will be um, in an arch, upward arch around the head. Very, very important to determine that before you begin working on a portrait. If there's any forward or downward tilt to the head, if there's a sideways tilt, and then if you, in some of the exercises, we're going to see a sideways and a backwards tilt. So you need to think about those arches. You need to think about the three sides. Do I see top, side, and front? And, and putting a box over that helps. So here's the, the exercise. If you have those magazine pictures, any of those magazine pictures, <clears throat> you can see that I've put a box over these three images. Um, and that, it, all the time as I go around the studio, um, I'll lay a little um, clear report cover over um, our reference photo and I'll take a dry erase marker and draw a box over the head to help you see. Because if you don't think about these three sides, you will make this face flat all the way across. You'll just work on it because you're working on a flat surface. You'll work on it if, as if it were flat and it will look flat. Um, in some of these, the light source is not very strong, so it's really difficult to tell where the head changes direction. Um, so typically I'll start the box at the hairline and the chin, and then try to see the angle of the face, like I did here. And so like on this far right one, I love this e example. You can see that the uh, eyebrows would be at this tilt going down to about 230. The nose will be perpendicular to that like railroad tracks and the chin. The, all, all the lines on the front of this face are gonna go down at a downward tilt. So if you've got time, if you wanna show, if you've got magazine pictures or something to do that to draw on, if you have a picture you don't want to draw on, you can just put a clear piece of acetate or report cover over the top if you're working on a portrait. I'll do this a lot of times when I'm working on a portrait. I'll just print the picture off or take it in Photoshop and draw these lines myself to keep that tilt really strongly impressed in my mind throughout the whole um, portrait. Any questions or observations about this? Is this new to anybody? Have you ever done this before? It's new. Okay, good. So if you want to um, text me, if you do the exercise, you want to text me the pictures, that would be great. Or if you want to show them to us, I'd love to see them. Um, I, it's funny how our brains um, and everybody, not just adult, not just kids, kids will make the craziest boxes. Um, a box can be hard to draw sometimes. So um, again, these exercises, um, I can't tell you how much difference it makes when you actually do it 
um, I, I think I've said over and over in my classes, it surely had us do draw negative space for like a two hour class. That's all we did was draw negative space. And I, I, I resisted it. Um, I, I grumbled in my spirit about it. I didn't want to do it. But I want to tell you, after I did that exercise, I was aware of negative space every single time I picked up a pencil or a brush. So these exercises really do um, make it more concrete as you do them. So in my worksheets, this, this one, this is also included. And so you can see these tilts, um, the different tilts of these heads um, and how important it is to look and find the box before you get started. You'll be amazed at how far over the, the face is sometimes. Um, like for instance, this first one, her, her uh, brow line ends right here. So the front of her face is only one third of the width of this whole head, if you include all that hair. So you, if you just jump in here and you just start drawing this, I guarantee you, you're going to have her eyes way over here. I'm always very surprised at how short of a space the face is in sometimes. And we have a preconceived idea about where the features lay on the head usually. So number one, number two exercise, number one is the, the apple, do apples, 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 apples. Number two, put a box over the head. Um, if you don't get anything else, put a box, put a box, put a box, and it will really help you. It's, unless you're doing a front on view, which the box is not as helpful because you don't see, you know, you don't see as much of the sides of a box. But most of the time, if you have any tilt at all, use the box. Any observations so far? Is it hard? Yeah. It's harder than you think, isn't it? <laughs> But it really makes you look for, and if you're if the head is tilted back, you're not necessarily going to see a box on the bottom, but you have to indicate that you can see underneath the chin. So a bucket is also helpful. If you can't get the box in your brain, try a couple of those pictures with a bucket over the head. Um, and that really helps you get the dimensional quality. So if I were to draw a box on her head... I'm going to think about the tilt of the features. And I'm going to think about where the face changes. I don't know if y'all can see that or not. Can y'all see those lines? They're not very thick. And then all when you're drawing a box, all these lines are parallel. I don't know if I have them straight. It's harder to draw in Photoshop. And you can see under her chin a bit. I know that's weird looking. But that just right off the bat, you can see how the shadow, what they call this, the um, there's a name for the edge where the shadow and the light meets. There's a new name I just learned recently. Do you, do you remember it, Norma? The Terminator? Was it Terminator maybe? Any, <laughs> it sounds like a movie or something, but anyway, right, right here is where the shadow starts. Um, so that's a really how it, it doesn't matter if your box is perfect, but it makes you look at the different plane, big solid plane. Um, let's look at another one. Yeah, it was called the Terminator. Terminator, thank you, Jackie. Uh huh. Th that was brand new for me. All right, here's another one. Let me see if I can make this line a little bit thicker so you can see it better. All right. And, you know, again, if you're going to draw the face, you can start with the eyebrows sometimes and that'll give you a t uh, the tilt. So let me raise that a little if it will. Eh, it won't. So if we were going to do features, we would be getting these lines parallel, but that helps me with the top of the box. So this way, right here at the brow line, I've got it over a little bit far. And we're seeing a little of the top of her head. We're not seeing under her chin at all. So that helps you. 
And all when you're doing a box, remember all these lines are parallel and they're the same length. I didn't do that one exactly right, but y'all get my jet, my drift here. See how um, if you do that before you start a portrait, you're going to work on that head as if it is is got a thickness and a dimension to it instead of a flat surface. Your brain, you, you just have to uh, help your brain along with this because again, we're looking at a flat picture. It's just one surface and we're working on a flat piece of paper or a flat canvas. So your brain has to work around that to, to think in the dimensional way. So this box um, exercise is probably one of the most beneficial ones. Um, so do it. Can you do the baby one for us? Yeah, let me see if I can pull the baby one up. Babies are hard. Great question, Carla. Thank you. Let's see what program I'm in here. Okay. <laughs> that just has to make you smile, doesn't it? Can y'all see it? That's the other reason. I know. <laughs> Let me make it a tiny bit bigger. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the Terminator line right here. And, you know, if you're not sure on this tilt, do the eyebrows first. See how that gives you that tilt. If you have to use a little a ruler or something, that's fine too. So I would do here to here, make sure they're parallel. And babies are, we're going to talk about this more when we get into features, but babies are, everything about a baby is circular. So a box is really difficult. Um, and this is more of a front on view. Let's see. No, let's see. That's not right. Let me undo that one. Um, we're seeing a little of the top of the head here. And we're, you know, it's almost, it, this one's tricky. So you could see, you could say, you could almost see both sides of the face, right? From here to here. I know that's not a box, but because he's so fat. Thanks, Carla. You gave me the hard one. So you don't see under his chin much. But, but you do see two sides of the face. So you would know that this is the lightest plane because the light source is coming from the side. This is the front plane and this is the side plane. And that could even go back a little further than, than what I drew it. Um, I know that's weird looking, that's not really a box, but that's what's going on because of the way the face um, turn, the way the planes turn. Is that helpful? Christy. Yes. Yeah. That yeah, that was that's really good. Um, I, it 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 all seems um, right and everything, but why don't? How come you don't go to the end of their head, like on the side? Yeah, I should have like the boxes. Yeah, I should have pulled no, this well, line I was over. One, I don't, yeah, I mean the like the last line going toward the ear, you know, right? Yeah, I'm just wondering why it's not. Yeah, it should have gone all the and way I don't know out. If that was, yeah, it, I mean, is that? correct or i was just no uh, looking you're, at it as you're right look it should go all the way out like that and this one should go all the way like this yeah exactly i was right. yeah yeah you're right um i yeah i don't know i mean you're right it goes even further but does the face you yeah. know a baby's head is big round and it's almost it's this head is a little bit boxy you can see the boxiness to this head too. You're exactly oh, right. Okay. So when you're doing this on your magazine pictures, you're really wanting to get the feeling of that whole plane. So, so yeah, you can take it all okay. the way back. Yeah. Great okay. observation. Great observation. And then remember all these features are going to be parallel um, because your brain, again, I'm going to tell you, if you don't put these, when you start with the features and I'll talk about this next week, but if you don't put these lines in, your brain is going to knock this eye down here when you start painting and you're not even going to know you did it. You're going to, uh, cause I'll walk around and people have pulled that eye down and they're like, Oh my goodness. I didn't, that is crazy looking. I didn't even see that. I did that. Something your brain tries to do. I've never heard anybody talk about this in classes, but I just see it. Um, 
over and over as I go around and help students. So just be careful and make sure you indicate the tilt of the head and the tilt of those features. But no, yes, please always. Um, it's amazing on these videos when I, when I video myself, um, I'm just going in the flow. I'm going in the flow and I'm saying things and sometimes they're wrong. I'm like, you know, um, that ear and I'm really talking about the nose or something. I have to go back in the video and, and correct myself because I, I say the wrong words. But yes, that's exactly how I would see this. And that's weird. That's not a box right there. That's more of a octagon shape or a pentagon shape. Um, but whatever you have to do to divide it, actually this line, this front line could have gone over a tiny bit more to here. And I can't find all my controls for Photoshop right now to erase those. But that front plane, maybe it's broken down even more because it starts to turn here. And again, babies are much more round than adult. an adult head um, has more planes to it. Um, and this is evident in a 13 year old boy like my grandson, who all of a sudden in this last six months, his voice changed. The roundness of his face has started to become more angular and structural. And so when you've got a baby going on here, you've got a lot of round little small planes that, that, that help you go around the, the head. So if, if you can break it into as many planes as possible, that will help you a lot. With that being said, since I, I have this, have yeah, question. yeah, go ahead, Jackie. I love the questions. I love them. Okay, now, um, now earlier, you said that, um, or is it supposed to be? You said that the baby's features start on the third, the third of the the. Um, but in this case, is that the second? Is that the middle with his eyes because of where his eyes are, according to where the ear is? It looked like it's in the it's in the middle and not in the third. The and third. Um, that's a great question because um, it depends on the tilt of the head. There's no perfect okay. formula for doing the, the thirds. If if your head is down like this, then this this is going to be really squished. These I are going to be okay. longer. So with okay. this one, we could just observe. You have to use your powers of observation and see how they okay. compare. Where's his chin? Is his chin a little bit lower right here? Because he's got a little double right. chin going on. And okay. then measure. Um, and I can do that by taking this little line right here. And um, I could copy it and see how many of those I could fit in there. No, it's not gonna work. But checking these three to see, and they're almost identical. Where's the halfway mark? Right. Well, I'd have to check, let's see. I'm gonna guess it's here, but I have to use a pencil. I'm so used to using a pencil to measure things. Yeah. No, nope, the halfway mark is here on the eyebrows for the baby. Let me double check it. Nope, it's longer than that. So you just want to find your halfway mark on a baby. And because he's tilted down a little bit, it's different. Yeah, the halfway mark is right there, it, which, which is the top of the eyes, which is the same as an adult head. So you have to check these things over and over uh, because, they're, again, we always want a formula because we feel kind of safe in a formula that works across the board. But you can't skip your powers of observation and you can't skip measuring. That's why I'm such a proponent for measuring. And I know it's everybody and their brother are resistant to measuring, but it works every single time. So, so, so the rule don't always apply then that's like that because it depends on the tilt, the tilt. of the head. Exactly. And, all of that. and you'll okay. look, we'll, we'll look at some different images. Okay. Like for instance, let's look at this one. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So let me make that a little bit bigger. Uh, and I'm taking a little bit more time on this, but I think it's important because if you don't, if you don't stop. So let me see, here's her, the edge of her eyebrow is usually about where you see, I'm not, not going to start with that one. Let's do her, her eyebrows to get the, the tilt. Okay. And then here's her hairline here. All right. 
and I went a little bit too far on that. It's hard in Photoshop, sorry, but you get my drift here. Here's the box. All the way to the back of the head. And that also kind of helps you, I didn't go quite far enough, but that kind of helps you see how big, I'd have to go way up here for the top. But remember with the box that these lines are parallel. It's not gonna be exact, but it, it what it does is it breaks that down for you. And I, I should have gone, but that's kind of where the end of her jawline ends. Uh, so her features now, if I were to measure from the top of her head, which is way above here, the halfway mark on her would be right about in here. See what I mean? So this would be about the halfway mark from the top of her head to the bottom of her chin. So that's those are important things. And again, I don't want to confuse you because it's, it's really simpler than you think. Um, but just thinking about the head, especially this photo, which is light coming from everywhere. So there's no real shadows to help you with the, the dimensional quality of the head. But if you were to work on it, and I'm going to tell you, if you were to just put your strokes on this way and this way, and you're going to see it in some paintings in a minute, you're going to see how the, the painters, uh, if you paint using your brush as if you were sculpting a, a head in clay, and if you put your strokes on in the direction of these planes, even if your values are wrong, you're going to have a feeling of depth and dimension with just by virtue of your strokes, your pencil marks. It really does make a difference. Yeah. So again, the front of that could have been a little bit bigger. We could have drawn on this Indian lady. She's so lovely. We could have, you know, done this and, and given a little bit more of the side of her head just to see the plane change there. See how it starts to go around the side of the face. Um, again, this is no rule. These are just helpful tools that help me create a more convincing head. And I hope they'll be helpful to you as well. Any other questions? This is a great one. This one's hard and I, I don't have this one in Photoshop. It's, I don't know where it is, but um, I can't draw in PowerPoint, but you could draw a box here. Start with the brows because the brows really help you with the tilt and put that line in for the brows and then um, then try, try to, and then go to the edge of the brow. So your brow is really your marker here. It's what you want to use. Thank you for the demo. Oh yes, Carla, thank you for the questions. Please, please, please thank jump you. in and ask me questions. Don't feel like you're ever correcting me. I, I'm here learning with you guys. I am not sensitive about that. So I love, love, love your input. Um, this is the next one that breaks it down even further. Um, and this is where your magazine pictures come in. Um, you notice on the right, there's a grid scale of the face. And a lot of people do use grids. Denise, you told me when you first started drawing that you had some instruction in using a grid. Um, and I believe they can be helpful. And I use them, I've used them before in doing large murals and different things and trying to get a likeness. The one thing the grid does not help you with is the dimensional quality. Um, and it is a little mathematical and stiff for me. And sometimes it's not um, realistic if I'm working from life because I can't put a grid over a person's face unless I have, <clears throat> I've seen artists that build a big grid with wire and string and everything. Denise, jump in there. <clears throat> Give me yeah, time to the reason that I worked so hard to give that up is you would work a couple of hours laying out a grid and everything just right or more. It ended up taking me more time to do that than to complete the portrait. And I, that's why several years ago I said, I'm going to take every, I'm going to take a, a break and I'm going to do nothing but draw. And I never quit after that. Um, but it was a, uh, it was a, it ended up being an obstacle to me. And at the time I was just doing nothing but that, I didn't know. I just accepted that it was this hard. It didn't have to be that hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love that testimony because it, it's, it's, it felt, felt that way to me. It was like a whole nother step. It was like my husband started learning airbrush, had an airbrush for a motorcycle 
he was painting motorcycles for a while and all the different steps that it took to get to the art just drove me crazy. You had to frisk things and you had to tape and measure and do all this crazy stuff before you ever got the air gun out. And then you had to clean this air gun out, which took like two hours. And so a little bit gritting was a little bit like that for me. It kind of stifled some of the joy and creativity of just looking at something and drawing it. But then you get frustrated because when you just look at it and draw it, sometimes your preconceived idea of what an ear looks like or what a nose looks like will end up on the page instead of what you've actually seen. And so that's why measuring plumb lines and relative lengths, comparing relative lengths is so beneficial because you, then you can, you can draw free just any way you want to draw. And then you can go back and check yourself with these techniques and, and figure out and self-correct. And that's really my goal as a teacher is to help you learn how to self-correct so that you're not dependent or so that you don't get discouraged and throw the whole thing in the trash because it's too hard and you can't figure out how to fix it. Um, one of the things that um, is, in, is helpful in any of this is to find your halfway marks. And you'll see me do that in the demo of the head here in a minute and in the demo of the planes of the head in here in just a few minutes. But um, find your halfway marks quickly. On an adult head that's looking straight at you, the halfway mark is generally the eyes. The middle or the top of the eyes is usually your halfway mark. If you can find that early on, put little dots or little marks there, that's something you can come back to and will, it will keep you in, um, in the right area without getting too out of whack. Uh, that wasn't a real technical way to say that, but that's what it, that's, that's the deal. Um, using the planes of the head, again, you've got your magazine pictures there, hopefully. Um, try to break down the photos into as many planes as you can. I'm going to leave this, uh, let me show you this uh, painting. I think Carla, maybe you turned me on to this, or I found it on Instagram. I think Carla sent it to me one time. Thank you, Carla. Mike, and I Michael Mintler or something like that. Michael Mintler. Oh, good. I'm going to put that in here. You are so good. How do you I'll look it up him? and I'll make sure, but I think I'm pretty sure that's him. Mentler, got it. Um, I loved this quick demonstration of a head in the planes. Um, and I had some of my students have done this, just to copy this just for the exercise of looking at the planes. But I think you'll see in some of the images, um, and let me let me go ahead and show you a couple more things. I, this was on Instagram with Steven, Stephen Bauman. Um, this week, and I, I recorded it so that you could see it. He's using this in some of his educational videos, but look at how breaking that, those planes down, there's the sphere and the, the box on the chin, and here are some of the planes, not all of them. It's a simplified version, um, but look how that adds that dimensional quality to it. This is on Instagram if you want to look up Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Bauman. Um, I have bookmarks on my Instagram. So I have one for instructional images. And so this is under my instructional images on uh, Instagram. There again, it's really super fast, but you can see how that's how helpful that is. Um, I'm going to come back to the magazine pictures, but I want you to also see how this plays out in paint. So I found these on my Instagram account for Shane. And these are his step-by-step -step images of a head study he's doing for a large portrait. And you can see his strokes are mindful of those planes. You can see evidence in his paintings. And here's the close-up of the final painting. But you see the dimensional quality to that head. Even though it's painted loosely, you can see the brushwork and how... Um, here, here is the very beginning stages. He's thinking about those planes, very simplified in this first stage. Um, and he does not begin with a real detailed drawing. I do. So I don't work this way. But you, you, no matter how you work, if you can start thinking about these planes from the very beginning, it'll, it'll hold you in good stead. Christy, yes. what do you call that technique of, of uh, painting? Because 
I mean, I tend to want to be more detailed, more realistic, but this seems to be more less stress of trying to get it perfect. So what do you think about what is, is this certain name for that kind of? Um, um, I don't know that it has a name. I know I always say this is coming in from the back door and I go in from the front door okay. <laughs> or maybe mine's the back door. Um, it neither is right or wrong. There are different ways of going about it. The, mm -hmm. Hey, Bridget, the thing I want to caution you about is if you work this way, and I did many, many workshops with Shane, and he's a wonderful teacher, wonderful painter. I felt lost, especially in my first workshop with Shane. If you don't know how to draw a head and you start working this way with paint, and he makes one big pile of color as he's mixing. So you really don't see what colors he's yeah. using, what values he's using. Right. It was, I, I have all my paintings from those workshops, but I felt, and I had Daniel Green. So I was trying to draw myself. I would have to draw a little bit of a, of a face on here. If you're, if you're established and you know how to get a face on there and you know how to get a likeness, this would work for you. But I liken this to starting with a ball of clay and beginning to slowly carve the features to where it doesn't look like them at all. Yeah. But it will start to look like them if you have all the features in the right place, which is what we'll discuss next week. Getting a likeness has more to do with the features being in measured properly. And Shane didn't ever talk anything about measuring or proportions of length. So for me coming in, I had that foundation. So I wasn't as lost as some people were. But um, this... Yeah. I'm go sorry. ahead. No, go ahead. go ahead. Mary just said on, on the chat that it's impressionalism, I guess. This, um, well, I, mean, I don't know, but I'm just, yes. He, yes, he is a he is more of a loose painter, but yes. his finished paintings, um, can some of them can get very tight and not impressionistic. So, but every one of those impressionistic painters knew how to draw. Okay. They their beginning drawings were beautifully rendered and tight. And the longer they painted, the looser they got. And I liken that to developing a love affair with paint because the longer you do this, hold on, the longer you do this, the more you want to see the thickness of the paint and the strokes because you love squeezing that paint out. Right. So you cannot skip, in my opinion, in my experience, you cannot skip the important step of learning to draw and get a likeness and these boxes and the measurements and the plumb lines and proportions of length. Um, because you'll, you'll get frustrated with this big pile of paint and all these blobs on there. Um, so that's just my experience with it. Now, some people do not like all the details of it there. It goes totally against their personality. So I'm always respectful. I had a, uh, Carla will remember Jordan, um, a professor uh, that used to come to class and he started this way. He just had big blobs and he slowly carved out the likeness. Um, and so I think it's personality and temperament too. Um, if it drives you crazy to try to measure and do all that detail, don't, don't feel like you have to do it, but use it, use these tools to correct yourself and to figure out, because every time I would go around, to, and I don't think he would mind me saying, every time I would go around to his easel and measure and show him some things, he'd go, oh. And so I believe if you put it in your pocket and you use it later to come back in and, and correct yourself, you'll be much happier with your outcome. And you won't just have blobs. One of the first paintings he brought for me to critique was beautifully done head, but the neck was real tiny. And so the head looked gargantuan on this tiny neck. And when I did one measurement for him and I showed him that the neck was the same as maybe from the tear duct to the chin was the same width as the neck. And he went, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. So that one correction of learning to see what's the same, samey, samey on your original was like Eureka to him. So um, planes, of the, planes of the face. So take a few minutes and here um, Stephen Bauman has a, done a planes of the pair um, I, so I thought this was interesting. You can put anything into planes to make yourself see it in a more dimensional way. I think it's very, very helpful. Maybe over the top for some, they may not want to go to this much detail. 
Uh, but let me go back to the magazine images here and let you do a couple of these. If you haven't, if you've had time to do them, I want to allow for time for the for the planes of the head video too, because I have quite a few more uh, slides to show you. Hmm. So it helps to, let me move him over so you can see the planes of the head. Let me go back to the planes of the head. It helps if you have a picture uh -oh, of the planes of the head up. So let me go back to this one. I'm gonna leave this one up for you. Let's see what we can do. I can't draw in PowerPoint, so I'm having to maneuver some things around. Okay, different, there we go. Uh, by the way, Photoshop in January, I believe. Um, I can't remember what month I'm doing Photoshop. Okay, so thinking about the planes of the head, let us draw. I think it's helpful if you start right here on the glabella and you draw that little diamond shape first. Um, I think that helps. And, and when you get ready to start drawing your planes of the head, if you'll start, if you'll, I'm gonna show you in the video how we start with the top of the head and the bottom of the base. And then, but it's helpful to start in the middle right here and then start drawing the lines. And this one's so dark, it's kind of hard to see. Let me make my, my line white here. Anyway, you catch my drift. I don't want to spend too much time on this. <clears throat> Here it is. Okay. There we go. Maybe that'll work. Nope, they're still dark. You can't see them. But anyway, you catch my drift of just drawing um, as many of these little planes as you can get away with, thinking about this planes of the head. And if you want to um, keep an image of the planes of the head, Denise, I know she bought one. Carla, do you have one? I know some of you have bought the yeah. planes of the head and they've made new ones. Uh, John Asaro, I'll send you that link. They're expensive, uh, but you can find the images. I've sent you some of the images um, that I took. Um, it's a really helpful exercise and you can light this head so many different ways. You can do it just with natural light. You can put a really dramatic light on it and get some really dark darks and, and light lights. Um, but I think all the way around, it's a great exercise. Um, and just to, to do the magazine pictures, especially on, you know, these high fashion magazines, there's no shadows on the face. So for you guys that are wanting to do portraits, try, you know, when, when I have a client that's sending me images, I tell them to please send me a variety of images. Try to, if you're going to go outside and take pictures, try to get under a tree, try to do it late in the afternoon when you have side light or early in the morning when you have morning, you know, cool morning light or evening uh, warm light because it's going to be really hard to create a dimensional looking face with, you see this one of Gwyneth Paltrow here. There's no shadows at all on this face. Very difficult to, to create a dimensional painting out of a picture like that. Now, if you've done it a lot, if you've done a lot of portraits, you can sort of make up a light source and thinking about, I'll, um, sometimes I'll get this planes of the head out and I'll light it the way, if, if I can see a little bit of light, for, for instance, her spotlight or her little catch light is on the left side of her pupil. So that's usually my little clue that the light is coming somewhat from the front side. And they've probably put reflectors and everything on her to throw light all into her face because we look better when we don't have a lot of shadows on our face sometimes, especially the older we are. Um, but I'll I'll put the head and I'll use that planes of the head to help me shade a face when I have a poor image. Any questions or any observations about about this exercise? So you can actually buy this this uh, 
This head is planes. It's called Planes of the Head. Planes of the Head by John Asaro. Uh, Denise, jump in there. I was just, I've got mine set up. I was just going to turn it around so they could see it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. Is it, is it the John Asaro version? It is, but okay. they don't. I prefer yours. And this is the newer, uh, some type of hard plastic something. Okay. And it's, but it screws right onto a tripod so you can put it at in, anywhere you want it. So how do you spell his last name? Hasara with the H? A-S-A-R-O. And I'll send you the link to it in the recap today. Let me make sure I'm writing these down. Um, and they have some different versions of it now and different companies are selling it. Some of them look younger. This is a man. You can see that the right side has um, a little more detail. The left side is more is sharper, like an older person. The right side's a little bit smoother. There's two sides to this face. Um, and, and mine, has, mine has two sides. Okay. That's why I turned it to one side because I didn't want to get, you know. But yeah. it's been it's been a few years since I bought mine, so they may have come up with even better ones now. If you'll just Google it, you'll find a lot of different faces for children. Some of them are round and they don't have such sharp angles. I like the sharp angles because they really help me see the individual planes. Your paint is naturally, or your pastel is naturally going to soften these out. But if you can see them in a sharp, defined way, for instance, the tip of the nose, you see that you have this, this light tip that's facing the sky you have the underplane and then you have another underplane right here. So this is broken down into three planes. One, two, three. The same with the nostril. You can see the underplane, a, a side plane that's facing out a little bit, and then a top plane that's facing more up, upward to the sky. So anything that you work on, it, going back to the pairs, it's very helpful to try to break it down to as many uh, planes as you can and see things in a uh, dimensional way. Um, all right. Um, and again, send me your magazine pictures. I, I would love to see those. Text them to me or email them. Um, Rick Casali did a, two, a, a couple of demos at, at Warehouse 521 over the last few years. He was so gracious to let me. I videoed with my phone the first one. And I videoed almost the entire demo. It was fabulous. And he is a, oh. a painter and a sculptor. Oh, but listen, the video that he let me video, and I, I, uh, I edited it, I put it up on YouTube, and I sent him a, um, a request to see if it was okay if I posted it. And he, he got right, he's such a darling. He got right back with me. And he said, oh, gosh, I that's a lot of information I gave away, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, yes, it was very valuable. And he said, put it out there. He said, I, if you hoard things, it's not good for you to hoard things, put it That's out there. Right. And he let me put that in time. It's two parts. So I think it's almost two hours of instruction, but this was so helpful because he talked about, he rolled that big muscle. What's that one called right here that wraps around your neck? I, I can't remember it now, but he rolled that big snake and he slapped that thing on the back of the head and rolled it around the front. And I have never forgotten that muscle since I watched him do that. He had a skull there. He would pick up the skull and he would talk about what that was called and he would push it, the, the clay. And you saw all those individual. And he was at that time working on a, a new planes of the head. Um, oh, that. So I'm going to send you this link for Rick too on my, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, and if you have time, I would encourage you to watch it. You'll just love it. And he's cute. Oh, he's so cute. So, you know, that helps too. I he's love cute. clay. I love it. I want to oh. get my back in it again. I love it. You will love this. And he's posted some more videos since then. This, this was several years ago, but um, you will love it. It will help you with your drawing and your painting to watch the video. Uh, that's the primary reason I went. Um, this next slide is another uh, slide, another sheet that I have in the set of worksheets that I'm going to send to you. This is out of Andrew Loomis's book, and it's really training your eye 
to see form within the contours. Now, what I mean by that is the first drawing here, and let me let me let me toggle back and forth between these two. This is by Charles Barg, the plates by Charles Barg. These are very famous. Uh, there are lots of courses called the Barg method, B-A-R-G-U-E. Um, this is the contour drawing and this is the tonal drawing. And you see the difference in dimension and realism. And if you look up the, the Barg plates, uh, you can, I'm going to send you, I thought I put it on here. I'm going to send you the, there it is, uh, the Pinterest page. I'm going to send you that link that you can see a lot of his plates. Uh, over 200 lithographs um, of the work of Charles Barg. He, he taught this course um, for copying and learning, almost like the, uh, the casts that they study in Italy. You know, they just do the white casts for like two years before they ever start thinking about color. Um, so these are helpful tools for you. Uh, but I want to go back to Loomis's worksheet here because you see the, the linear drawing. Then you see the values added. And then you just see the simple mass shapes, which is what we typically do. I'll draw a contour drawing. Then I'll do the quick block in of the masses and then I'll get the full range of values and develop the drawing or the painting. Same with the tree. You see the linear drawing, you see the block in and in the middle, you see the, the finished, a combination of linear and mass, linear and mass. So you want to think in both, um, a mixture of both. And sometimes Shirley had us do, and, and I have this um, worksheet and another one in there included. She had us do, turn it upside down and do a drawing with only mass, no lines were allowed. And that is a wonderful exercise for you to do, to not let, try not to let yourself use the point of the pencil, but use the side of the pencil. If you have to draw in a shape, then mass it in really quickly and, and do the whole thing in mass and try to do it upside down. This one would be great. This is just a cover of American Artist that I took. And this is a drawing that's totally done in mass with no contour lines. And you see how soft and painterly it is, um, especially for those of us who are detailed fanatics. And we like to get down there and draw every leaf and make the eyelashes. If you'll make yourself do a few of these mass drawings and turn them upside down, you'll be surprised if you do the whole thing upside down, then you flip it over. You're going to go, oh, wow. You know, it's like those, those funny demos that people do and they flip it over and you're like amazed at what, what the drawing is. Um, so again, I'm going to send you Charles Barg's um, link so that you can look at some of those images. Um, that is the last of the exercises. I want to show you a little bit about color before we move to the planes of the head, because we've still got a whole hour left, um, and I may go back a little bit. Here are just a few paintings by various artists um, that I wanted you to just look at and see if you see evidence of planes of the, of the head in these paintings uh, with value, with brushwork. Um, they, they, I've chosen them because they do have a good dimensional quality to them. Um, hold on. Oh yeah, I've got some more stuff down here. I've got plenty. Here's another one by Gregory Mortensen, I think. Even though this is a profile, which profiles tend to be a little harder, they can look really flat. You see, um, look at the value change from here to here, to here, to lightest plane. Then it starts to darken and warm. There's a value change here. There's a value change here. So look as you move across that head at all the different value and temperature changes that are going on to create a dimensional head. Even on the ear, you have this value, which for this area is the darkest. Well, this is the darkest, but you've got medium, medium light, light. You've got three values on that lobe to give it that dimensional quality. So it really requires training to slow yourself down and see all the the angle changes, all the value changes, all the plane changes. I don't know why I have that one in there. That's not a real good. 
Here's another one that's a little tricky because it's got some weird lighting on it. Dappled light can be a, a little challenging because um, if you have a strong piece of light like this, it flattens everything out. But you still see this cool tone, cool dark overall, if you squint your eyes. You see um, the Terminator line here, which is a warm, glowy line. Then you see middle, middle tone light. Then you see light. Then you see highlight. So you see one, two, three. There's a little bit of a temperature change here. Four, five values across that face. And you see the planes. Even though it's very smooth and rendered almost realistically, you still see the value changes. What's the Terminator again? The Terminator is the line where the shadow and the light meet. It's a strong line that if you're not careful, you can make it too harsh. So, and it's a new term. I don't know who came up with it. <laughs> All right. This next image I want to add because it has to do with color. We're not going to really do any exercises with color, but I'm going to send this to you uh, because I feel like I found this when I was looking for something else on YouTube. It's a video by... Ben Lustenhauer. I don't know anything about him, but I've, I've seen this uh, three color zone before. I've, I've heard a couple of different teachers mention it. Uh, it's not, you don't see this all the time. You have to, again, use your powers of observation. But if you've, if you've been introduced to this and you think about this, when you look at your model, you can think about, and it makes sense, if your light source is coming from the upper left, it's going to be, and especially if it's a warm light source, if it's a tungsten light or the, the forehead is going to catch most of the light and it's going to be very warm and ochre. The midsection, including the nostrils where most blood is, the cheeks and the ears is going to be your pink or orange, bright, warm section. And from the nose down, it's going to be a lot of cool tones, especially on a man, because men have a, a beard, so it'll be blue or green. Even women, though, and especially if they're wearing a cool color, there's lots of cool tones that are going to bounce into the chin area. So I, I screenshotted his video, and I'm going to send you the link if you want to watch the whole video. Um, I didn't watch it all. It was quite long. But I did, I did feel like this was very helpful for you to see. Here is the final. No, that's the first one. I thought I did the final one. But you can see the three distinct color zones. And this makes sense because a lot of times in pictures, you won't see these beautiful warm tones. The ears are almost blood red sometimes if there's light coming through them. There can be bright orange, cad orange in the ears. The nostrils the cheeks. Um, it's very, very important to try to see the color temperature. Here's another worksheet in a book by Roberta Clark. She's done several um, books on portraiture. And she said that the head can be divided and seen as if three areas, golden or yellow on the top, um, warm, rosy or ruddy across the midsection, and the bottom section can be, it'll be flashy. You know, you don't want to put blue all across here because it'll look like they're asphyxiated. But you, you will find cool tones in there. So learn to look for those cool tones. Oh, awesome. Those are awesome images, Bridget. Will you share those on the Facebook page later? I think if we could just keep looking at these and sharing them, she's done some different images with the planes exercise. That's great. Um, so what I'm saying about these color zones is learn to look for them when you're mixing your colors. There's, it's not a rule. It's not a formula because you won't see that across the board. It depends on lighting. It depends on skin tone. But learn to look for ochre, warm, cools in all three of those zones. Um, let me show you some examples. This is a Russian painter, and I'm sorry I can't pronounce her name. Very impressionistically done and very strong, but I wanted you to see how much warm, how much, um, how much yellow ochres, how much warmth, and how much green is down here. A little creepy on the green, but she's outside. So I like to show you strong 
um, examples so that you'll remember this because we'll put them in and then what do we do? We just blend it right out. And then we just got this drab color. Um, even I, I posted the portrait I'm working on on uh, Facebook this week. And I was nervous about sending it to the client as I always am. I knew she was going to say, oh, the cheeks are too pink. Because you know me, I always put lots of pink cheeks in there. She loved it. She said her cheeks are always red like that because she's always hot. She's always running around. She's a little energizer bunny. So put air on the side of too much color and then tone it down. <clears throat> but make yourself get across the room and look at it. Because if you don't put color in there, I've seen so many drab, dead looking portraits. And a portrait is viewed six to eight to 10 to 12 feet away. So if you don't put color in it, it's not going to. And look how alive this looks, how vibrant and happy and energetic it looks. We're painters, y'all. <clears throat> we're supposed to use this color to, uh, you know, we're supposed to enjoy it. <clears throat> this is um, Joe Bowler. If you don't know his work, he's wonderfully soft, realistic portrait painter. And this is just a little piece of a large uh, portrait of a mother and children. <clears throat> but I wanted you to see the warm tones in the head, the ochre tones in the forehead, the warm tones through the midsection, and some cool olive tones in the lower section, even on a baby's face. Um, <clears throat> and you can see, if you really broke this down, you could, you could see his planes. You see a change here and here and here. So you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven value changes across the forehead. So there again, go back to your planes of the head. And as you're painting, make yourself slow down and try to see all those different value changes. Here's another example. <clears throat> uh, Juliet Aristides. Sorry about that. There must be some blue light jumping around because you see it everywhere in this painting but you do definitely see the bright cad oranges through the midsection of the face. So I did want to touch a little bit on color. Another example, you see a, a very light ochre. You see some warm places, the ear, the, the bottom of the nose, the cheek, and then you see some really cool blue tones in his chin. So, um, here again, you see the cool tones of this white shirt reflecting up under the chin. This is Shane's portrait of Senator Kennedy. Uh, look at these hot pieces of color through the midsection of the face. And even around the tear duct, sometimes you'll see that warm or even hot color through there. Okay, one more little section here on, two more sections, sorry. Uh, and we'll get to the planes. Um, this is out of Harley Brown's book on portrait sins. I'm going to send you these images because I think, and if you don't have the book for a while, the books were several hundred dollars because they were hard to find. I don't know how much they cost now, but I love Harley Brown. I love his teaching in his books. There's some few of the art books really have a lot of good instruction in them. Harley Brown's have great instruction in them. Um, <clears throat> this is called Magdalena. And he points out some, problems. He paints it with the, the portrait sins in it, and then he rescues it. So let me show you uh, the main ones that he mentions here. Um, making both the shadow side and the light side warm. It makes the face hot overall. So the, the, the light side of her face is all warm, and the shadow side is all warm with a few cool tones in it. Um, over intensifying the reflected light. Um, reflected light meaning this purple under her chin, because a lot of times you'll see light under there and you'll make it too light. The same way you'll see dark and you'll make it too dark and look like a hole. Um, making the upper lip too dark and hard, um, making it almost black making the line between the lips a straight line instead of watching for all the curves. And we'll talk about a lot about that with the, um, when we talk about the mouth. 
Here's another one, going highlight crazy. Making every highlight the same intensity, it gives the face a metallic or a plastic look. And that's something to be very careful of because we are like bugs. I say this almost every time. <clears throat> We're attracted to the light. And so sometimes we make the lights too light. We over uh, accentuate the lights. Um, let's see. Thinking that white hair is actually white, even in the shadowed areas. Um, putting highlights in the eyes when they're not actually there. Now that's a tricky one because I'll do that sometimes. Um, adding a light, sharp line over the lip, almost like a milk mustache, making it too light. These are big errors. Drawing wrinkles on the face as lines and placing too many of them, hoping they will add character. So um, you want to be, you want to simplify wrinkles. You want to de-emphasize them, but they are an important part, especially in an aging person. So it's tricky uh, handling wrinkles. So let's look at the rescued version. And I put the, the, the bad one up so that you could see. Let's see if I can move it over a little bit. There we go. Um, so what he's done on this one is the edges of the hair against her forehead now are very lost and soft. Beautiful. Um, form and cast shadows are distinct on the face, but the edges are softened. Um, eyebrows don't have a painted on look. They're not artificial in appearance now. So, and again, we'll talk about that when we do eyes, but you want to put them on strong, but then you want to take flesh and you want to wiggle them back in and make them soften into the flesh. Um, highlights are used very sparingly and have varied intensity. So again, you want to you want to determine your lightest lights, which hurt the light really seems to be coming from the side here, because typically your lightest light would be up here on the forehead. But looking at it, this is a cool highlight right here on her nose and her cheek. That's the lightest light and nothing else is that light. So ask yourself that. The background is not an afterthought. The nostrils are not made too obvious. He, call, he calls this nostrilitis when you make these big black holes. And especially if you're working from a photograph, you're going to see these nostrils being big black holes. Remember, the nostrils, there's air and life in there. So they have warmth. They're warm colored. They're not blue or black. So watch how you render nostrils. The line between the upper and lower lips is variable without a hard drawn in feeling. Um, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit more. I'll do it in a minute. Um, reflected light under the chin is very low key. It's not popping out. It doesn't break up the chin under there, but there is some reflected light under there. And you would have to ask yourself, is it as light as this? No, it's never as light. Reflected light in the shadows is never as light as light coming from above. So that's a, always a good checkpoint. The texture and shape of the necklace, necklace work. I don't even see the necklace in this one, but um, a little bit of an indication of a necklace there, but it's really not strong and hard like this broken line is. Look at the difference in the mouth. And again, I think the mouth is what we struggle with the most. And we're going to really spend some time on that. But look at the softness. Look at the, the, the soft lost and found edges on this face and how he's corrected it. And you see the darkness of her skin. And um, just beautiful. Look how so, he didn't mention it. But look how if you painted these dark lash lines in, then you would want to take something and soften them and blur them a little bit. Uh, no hard edges on a face. You really want to be careful. There are no hard edges on a face. Is that helpful? Seeing this portrait scenes. I like before and after shots. Um, this is another image that I found by, hmm, I believe it was Juan Ramirez on Instagram. And it just shows some of his studies with color 
and how he starts with a simplified drawing. He blocks it in and then he moves to more, more values in more detail. Um, and this is really the last little segment I want to show you. This is another one of Stephen Bauman's instructional images uh, using complementary colors. Because a lot of times when, when I get into skin tones and we, I have a um, lesson I do on painting skin tones, you, you look at the face and you ask yourself, is it pinkish? Is it yeah, ochre, yeah, more ochre colored, like a yellowish skin tone? Is it orangish? I ask myself, even in a dark colored skin tone, I ask myself, does it feel yellow, ochre, warm? Does it feel pink? Does it feel orange? Um, overall in the light, warm areas of the face. Then I make a decision using the compliments very often. If it's a very red, pink, uh, pinkish face, then I would use more greens in the shadows. Unless there was a really strong shirt that was bouncing all into the face. So if I had a really pink skin tone, I would put greens, but they might be blue greens if she's wearing a blue blouse. So the use of compliments, and he says, this is, I think, Sergeant, this is what I call impressive. When you make harmony out of complementary colors with that amount of chroma in a very naturalistic portrait. Um, you know, if it were all this green color, it would look deathly. It would look scary. But you can see the colors that he's mixed right here or the colors that he's pulled out. There is an app on your phone and I'll send it to you that will help you isolate colors. I can't think of the name of it right now, but you can pull up a picture on this app and you can put the little picker on the color and it will show you that color. And so you can look at that and mix it if you're having trouble determining a temperature or a, a color for skin tones. Um, here's another use of very beautiful peachy colors. This is, I believe, Sargent. Um, no, it wasn't Sargent, it was somebody else, but it's Tadima, Lawrence Talma Tadima, the Victorian type painter. But you see the, the kind of peachy and green color. So use your color wheel often. Here's, here's the color wheel again. It's this uh, peachy color across from the green color down here in this beautiful painting. But you see those tones, but you see peach as well under here. It's not all green. So just learn to look for these different temperature changes. Christy. Yes. You said, um, I know you don't know the name of the app, but what did you say it does? Um, it will let you take a color picker on your photo and just zoom in and it'll show you a little swatches of the color down on the bottom. And oh. I, be I believe it gives you the Pantone number. I, oh, if cool. you're a graphic artist, you have Pantone colors, which help you match colors when you're going to do a print job or something. And I believe it'll tell you exactly the color, but I'll wow. send you that app because I think it's yeah. useful. I don't use it much, but I think it's useful if you're trying to see color. I'll take my images. And when I do the Photoshop lessons, I'll take my images into photo and I'll bump up the saturation sometimes okay. stronger so that I can see little nuances of color in a photo. Um, oh, to make it more interesting. Okay. Um, nice. So here are a few pages, and I apologize, the quality is not good. This is a very old book that I have by Foster Cadel, C-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Um, I'm going to send you the name of that book. Um, he has done before and after paintings that illustrate common mistakes that people make. And I love these. And, and it shows you how, yes, this may look like the girl, but it's, you know, you see maybe two values on the skin tone here, but it's rendered very uh, flat. It does not have a good dimensional quality to it. Um, the, they're old images. They're from the 60s and 70s. So the, the, the print quality is not very good, but you see the difference in 
having a good, strong light source and rendering all the values. And here's your cool tones. Here's your warm tones. Here's your ochre tones on this one. Um, so I thought these were great examples of the head. And I'm going to be using some examples of the different features out of his book as well to show you how to get those more realistically um, rendered. Uh, here's another one. And, you know, it's probably looks kind of like the girl. But again, it's done very much in a coloring book fashion without much thought of the different values to get the face to look dimensional and feel dimensional. Um, he's, the comment he made, it made here is lack of modeling values on the head and features, painting what you think you see instead of what is actually in front of you. Look at her eyes on the one on the left. Her eyes. They're different sizes. They are. <laughs> and listen, that's a common thing. And you can sit there and work on a painting sometimes for hours and you don't see it until somebody comes up and goes, oh, and, and you know, if you were to draw a line here, you would see. And when we get into the eyes, you're going to see that typically you can fit one eye between here. Typically, not always. Some people's eyes are a little further set. Usually, if you're looking at a face straight on, you can fit five eyes across. So we're going to look at that when we get into that. But but again, I wanted you to see the tonal quality of his values and the, the individual planes that you can see on his on these uh, images. This is a sergeant painting. I just wanted you to see the beautiful planes in his paint strokes. You can go across here and you can see how he varies. If you study sergeant's brushwork, look at the strokes going this way. You can see a dimensional quality with his, within his brushwork. You can see a knowledge of the planes of the head. Um, so this last segment, we've got about uh, 40 minutes, which is exactly enough time for me to play this video. Um, okay, I've positioned the planes of the head so that it's getting natural light from the window. And I put gray, middle tone to middle tone dark gray behind the head so that it would stand out better. I have a white cloth under it and I've positioned my easel so that I can quickly glance back and forth at the head. Um, I'm using gray scale Strathmore paper just because I wanted a gray background so I don't have to work so hard to get um, my values. I've already got my middle values with the gray. I am using some vine charcoal, a piece of pastel or Conte white. You could use white charcoal, white pastel, white pastel pencil. I'm using one of these little blenders that we talked about a few months ago in our drawing techniques videos. You can order these on Amazon. I'm gonna use those to blend. I have a Tortillon solid paper, not a wrapped blending stamp, stump. And then I just have a bamboo skewer that I've popped the, the point off of to measure with. I'm going to lay out and just show you quickly how I would begin to draw the planes of the head. I could use a also a kneaded eraser or some sort of an eraser. In charcoal, you it's just easy to wipe it off with your hand, but if you want to use a kneaded eraser, and I also like this tri-tip eraser by General, it's a really good workhorse if you're having a hard time erasing. I also have, if you don't like the vine charcoal, you can use a regular charcoal pencil that I have sharpened to a long point. And let's see, also this is a white pastel pencil or you could use a white charcoal pencil for, to heighten your areas of white. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna decide where I'm gonna lay the head on this paper. It's small, I think it's a nine by 12, so it's not very large. I can't do life size, I'll do a little under life size. This is also a bumpy toothy paper. So I will not get really smooth um, transitions and smooth blending on this paper, but that's all right. This is just an exercise. So I'm gonna decide how tall I want the head. 
I'm gonna secure my easel first to make sure nothing's moving around. And I love this little tabletop easel. It's one of my favorites. I can adjust the height of it. So um, I'm gonna decide that my, I need a clip, a bulldog clip on it just to keep the paper from moving around. You don't need a moving target. So I've decided where the top of the head will be and where the bottom of the base will be. So now, from where I'm standing and I'm eye level with the planes of the head, I wanna find my halfway mark. And that varies depending on your eye level. And I believe the halfway mark is the top of the lip. Nope, I believe it might be the opening of the mouth. Yes, so the halfway mark from where I'm standing is right there. So I'll come over here and I'll divide the page into in half. Check it to make sure I'm pretty close. Maybe it could go down just a tiny bit. And double check that because that's an important measurement, the halfway mark. Yep. All right, and then I'm also gonna ask myself, how does the head compare height to width? And I have one eye closed and I'm looking at straight through the ears is the same as from the top of the head to the bottom of the chin. So I'll be able to check that as we move on um, into the drawing. But that's an important measurement that I wanna come back to. So I'm gonna look at the head quickly before I make um, any marks on the paper. And I wanna decide a few things. I did go ahead and find the halfway mark and I'm gonna come back to that later. I'm not gonna worry about that right now, but that's an important measurement. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna ask myself, how many heads tall is this image? So from my eye level, he is one and a little bit more than a half, one and a half heads tall. So one and a bit more than a half. So I'm gonna guess that this is where the bottom of the chin, one and a little more than a half of a head tall. Now I'm gonna divide the head into thirds. And I'm gonna go from the top of his head to this brow ridge, just about where the eyebrows would, would be. So here to here. Let me say quickly, in case you're not looking at the titles I put up, I'm measuring and the camera is a little bit low. So you're seeing the, the, the measuring stick a little off. So I apologize for that. And I, and I didn't go back in there and redo it with lines, but just know that they're, that they're what I'm saying is right, not necessarily what you're seeing on the camera level. From the brow ridge to the bottom of the nose and the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin are equal thirds. So now all I have to do is divide this space from the top of the head to the bottom of the chin into equal thirds. If this were a person, I would just focus on the face right now and I would divide from the hairline to the brows, the brows to the bottom of the nose, and the bottom of the nose to the chin. That's all I would worry about. And then I would add the head, the top of the head on later. That is how Daniel Green taught, and that's what's in me to do. But since we're seeing no hairline, we're seeing the whole top of his head, and he is equal thirds because he's an idealized version of the human head. So we're gonna go top of the head, and then all I have to do is make two marks. Don't worry about this halfway mark too much. Top of the head bottom of the chin, and I want to divide that into equal thirds. And then I want to check it. You can use your charcoal or whatever works for you. There to there. I'm a little bit off. I need to move this one down just a bit. And again, use your eraser if all these little marks start to drive you crazy and you don't know what they are. This is what trips everybody up, is this measuring. So a third a third, a third. All right, so now I have a relative idea of the height of the head, and I also want to decide the width of the head so that I have a bit of a cocoon to lay this in. And I know that from his ear to ear and top of head to chin is exactly the same. So I can come over here, because I watch people do this planes of the head often, and they'll make the head too skinny or too fat. And so if you decide this right off the bat, the height compared to the width, it will save you a whole lot of trouble. So I can go ahead, that looks really crazy wide, but 
The measurement does not lie. So right off the bat, I have height, width. I have from top of head to brow ridge, to bottom of nose, to bottom of chin. This is supposed to be the opening of his mouth. It doesn't like, look like quite enough space, but we'll see as we move further into the drawing. Um, these are the most important lines of demarcation. Um, I will now, starting at the top, like a window shade being pulled down, the top of the head, I'm gonna guess about where this line goes. I'm gonna pause again because I am working on this just like a child would in the very center of the page without thinking that my head is turned and the whole face, if I put a box over it, is over on the left side. So you're gonna see me put these marks straight down the middle out of an instinct that is wrong. Uh, normally, I would, if I'd done the box over it first, I would have pushed those features over, but you'll see how I correct myself. I just wanted to make that quick note. And then here's the brow ridge. Here's the little dot. Uh, and I'm standing up, uh, looking down on it a little bit more than the camera angle is. So I see a little bit more of the top of the head, if you're wondering about that. Glabella line. There's another tiny mark here. There's the tip of the nose and the underplane of the nose. There's the top of the lip, the opening of the mouth, the bottom lip, shadow under the lip, the cleft of the chin. And the, see, I've worked my way down and I can fit everything in there. I can continue going down and I can go ahead and note this, this area of shadow where it stops is about here. Here is the next triangle. There's the ridge of the base. Now, I don't have enough room to fit that in there. I may need to drop down just a bit. Chin, shadow, bottom of shadow, base, uh, top of the base, which is a little bit shadowed, and bottom of the base. So now I have so again, I, Daniel Green teaches this way, before you start doing any details to move down the head, once you've decided where the top of the bottom is, to move down. And if you get to the bottom and you see you don't have enough room, you haven't drawn all these features yet, and you're not all out of whack, you've made a little spot for each thing moving in small pieces because the brain can more accurately measure little small distances than it can big, large distances. So this, this may drive you crazy to do it this way. You do not have to do it this way. It is one way and it works for me. I do this every time I work on a portrait. Um, I, I move down, but you're going to see that I'm going to have to elongate these because the features are all going to be over in this side of the face because I've missed, you know, again, I did it right smack in the middle, which is what your brain tells you to do. Any questions about that? Is it, is it making your brain scrambled to think about doing it this way? It should because it it is very, your brain's like, I don't know what. And I, I tell you guys that when a Daniel Green, I was doing his vid, uh, workshop one time, keeping track of all the models. And when it came time for him to come to my easel, I had all these marks on the paper. And he said, so what are all these marks? And I was like, I don't, I don't know what they are. I was just frazzled. But I had put all the dots in and I was trying to do what he was teaching me. It did not come natural. It was not easy but it works, it works to see how things um, are divided proportionally. You don't have to do this. If it drives you crazy, just draw it like you wanna do it and use these techniques to correct yourself. The whole basic structure, I've worked my way down like a window shade and looked at all the different uh, measurements. So I don't, I don't start out working on the eyes and get down here and find out I don't have enough room to fit everything in. These are my areas of demarcation, top of head, this line here, which would be the hairline, the brow ridge, the glabella, the tip of the nose, the underplane of the nose, the top of the lip, the opening of the mouth, the bottom of the lip, the shadow under the lip, the cleft of the chin, the bottom of the chin. 
the, where the shadow or anything that you see under here that you could measure. You could also check to see from the bottom of the chin to the top of the base and see what it's the same as on the face. But I have a good base for starting this drawing. All right, so now from my perspective, he's at an angle, he's not straight on. So I'll need to move my lines over because the face, if I were to draw a box over this, the face is mostly on the left side. <laughs> so that it would be a good idea to do that before you even begin. Here's the front plane. I barely see a little bit of the eye peeking out from where I'm standing. And I can measure the width too to see how that compares. So from uh, the halfway mark from the ear to this brow ridge is probably going to be my halfway mark. Nope, it's a little bit in. So let's say the bridge of the nose. Nope, let's say somewhere between the bridge of the nose and the brow line is the halfway mark. Right here. Yep. So I can come over here because I know this is the right width and I can divide this space in half. Nope. So see your eye will lie to you. It'll tell you a different measurement. So here's the halfway mark. So that is where the uh, zygomatic arch is. That's where the edge of the face ends. So you need to make sure that you get all the face in this segment right here. And so see, I've made an error on that even. I confused myself. That is the halfway mark from the ear to this ear is right about here. That's the halfway mark. So this area where the brow ridge is is a little over. So you can see how easy it is to, to, to make an error here in the width of this face. The easiest way to do this head is probably a straight on view, but you very rarely have a straight on view. A lot of times your portraits look like a driver's license or a mug shot if you just have a straight on view like this. So most of the time the heads are tilted. So it will challenge you more if you'll do the head at a, at a degree of, of turn and figure out where your halfway mark is and then go over some. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to move on through a little bit of this video because I want you to see where I'm drawing. You know that I've got a little error in here. I'll have to correct, but I've start out with, since I have the length from top of head to bottom of base, I'm going to start out with this little diamond shape right here and work my way from the inside out. And the reason for that is if you start from the outside in, you're gonna get inside and you're gonna see you don't have enough room for all those little planes. But if you start from the inside out, you're gonna be able to fit them in much more accurately. And this is again, where Daniel Green talks about drawing a map of the United States. He said in fifth grade, he drew the outline of the United States and then he tried to start filling in all the individual states. And he found out quickly that he couldn't fit all the states in. But if he started from the center, drawing the center states, the shapes of those states, and worked his way out, he had a much more accurate drawing of the United States. So he, he goes about drawing a face in the same way. He, you know, he makes a place for it. Then he starts working his way like a window shade. And then he starts from the inside out. And you can judge those smaller distances much more accurately. So this next segment, you'll see me judging those shapes. Most of the time, if you're working with a model, the more interesting position is the three-quarter view. So uh, in keeping with the way Daniel Green teaches, he has you start in the center here and work your way out because you're going to be more accurate if you start from the middle and move in small increments. Now, don't get discouraged. This planes of the head is no easy exercise. So no matter how well you draw it, if you get some planes on here and you're able to start shading those planes and actually breaking down the head and seeing the different
values in the different uh, areas where the light changes, whoops, then you have been successful. See, I misjudged that line. It actually goes like this. So you're matching angles here. And you want to get this shape right from the beginning. I've got such a dark line on there that it's, it's a little distracting here. Actually, that's shorter. There we go. And it was helpful to note that this was the halfway mark, to put a little dot on the halfway mark, because then I knew that this diamond shape right here came right to the halfway mark. Okay, so finding your halfway marks is very, you don't always have to, you know, be slave to that, but that's an excellent way to correct yourself and figure out where everything, how everything lines up. All right, so here, then this angle begins to go down. I've already gotten too wide, I can tell. So let me go back here and check myself. Let me remeasure when you're not sure. So for me, this is the halfway point. That's about right. <laughs> and go ahead when you get a little area like this. If you see shadow, go ahead and shade it in because it'll help you have um, some anchors. There's a diamond shape right here. And that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, let me go back to my first measurements. One, two to the bottom of the nose, three to the bottom of the chin. So here's the bottom of the nose here. So I already have this too low. This is shorter. So you can see that I had that diamond shape. I put it way too low to start with and I'm seeing what it lines up with. So use these horizontal plumb lines. Um, you can see I... I... All right, uh, let's get back up here to the eye. So you've got this shadow plane under eye socket, bottom of the eye, under eye socket. And then there's about enough space there. Now I want to come over here and do the nose. And generally, I usually do the nose first. I did not do it this time. Shadow plane. Go ahead and get that in. Uh, you can correct your drawing with your eraser here in just a minute. As soon as you get a pretty good bit, and this is the width of the eye. This is the width of the... Ch of the uh, what is this? Cheekbone. <laughs> Your cheekbone. <laughs> Back here to the bottom of the nose is right here. <clears throat> and I started to erase this and start over and do it from a front view. But I really think that sometimes if you see my mistake or my tendency to start smack dab in the middle, that is, um, that's a common thing we always do. So typically we learn so much more from our mistakes. We don't do that again, usually. It's the tip of the nose. Here is the little diamond shape as it moves down. It's not a straight arch. That should have been bridge. That's not Here's straight. This little underplane. <clears throat> Go ahead and shadow that in if you want to. There's a bit of a shadow on this side. Don't lose that interesting geometry along the top of the bridge of the nose. <clears throat> Got the top lip.
This is uh, the side plane of the tip of the nose and it comes out a little bit further as the nostril here. Now we can check that because it's looking like it's getting too wide already. So let's see. The eye starts about here and you can check the width of the eye so you can fit one eye, one eye, and then this one will be a little foreshortened. Just there, there, go ahead and shade in this shadow, this triangle. You'll notice that the areas that I'm shading in are too dark right now, but they do help me to, to uh, divide the face up into the darkest darks that I see. This paper is very aggravating. You see it's got a huge web to it and it won't blend. So my values at the end are not really very accurate because I, I could, had to keep pressing into it. But I, I will tell you that as you're finding all these little shapes, it does help to mass in the darkest ones. You'll adjust the value of them later. Uh, you almost always make them too black and too harsh when you're using this charcoal. It's easy to mush things. And also remember, I'm standing a little more to the right than the camera is. So it makes videoing these things a little difficult because I, my angle has to be a little different or I'd be right in front of the camera. So I'm seeing it spaces a little bit wider than you are. But the main gist of this is see the shapes, move slowly and check the shapes, see what they line up with. And, and try to make a stab at it. The first time is not gonna be right. It's gonna be, it's gonna be wrong probably and you're gonna have to erase and correct it. But I want you to see that. I'm gonna fast forward through some of it because here again, I'm, you'll see me putting these dark shapes in first because they are easiest to identify and mass in. And then I'm using plumb lines to get where the chin goes. Don't try to lay this chin in without checking to see what it lines up with. It lines up with just under the nostril right here. So you want to make sure that you lay this in because, you you know, as you hang the rest of the face on, it can be this way or it can be this way. So use your plumb lines to, to check yourself as you move along. See a bit of the side of the face here, but it's very, it goes this way, then it goes this way, and then it goes that way. It's very thin right there side of the mouth comes straight down from just inside the eye um, here oops and i just smeared that that was actually bottom of nose the side of the mouth top of lip opening of mouth here's the side of the mouth right. Should have edited that out. Sorry about that. You get the real deal here. So again, this is really messy right now. Again, I'm standing over to the side. So I'm going to fix this. I'm going to show you how to fix it in just a minute. Uh, get all these little pieces in using the plumb line. Here's the triangle here. That's a good anchor point. Here. And look for the most obvious thing, like that big triangle there on the cheek. And that you can use that to gauge yourself as you're moving around because you get lost in all these little shapes, I'm gonna tell you. But if you'll find one that's pretty prominent for you, go back to that one, use it to gauge all the other shapes that are around it. Um, I'm gonna get, get on through the rest of the drawing of this planes. Uh, you also notice that I'm using very angular marks, short angular marks. Do not make long continuous marks. They will not be they'll likely not be accurate because your brain can only judge short distances of length. So I'm right on. I, I need to fix it. But this is the, um, the quick um, estimate of what I see. Uh, I have lots of corrections to make, but I've made some messy marks here. And I can come in here now and begin to develop this. At least I have it mapped out. And remember, your first map in 
is not gonna be a masterpiece. So just get it on the paper, even if it's all messy like this, uh, measure, get it on the paper, step back from it before you begin shading and, and jumping into all the detail. So now I'm pretty certain in my drawing, I can adjust that as I go. Now I wanna move in and lay in some of the values and start to blend those because I'll feel better. Just different things that you do make you feel better about the whole process. This is a cheap pastel, but I think it'll work. So I'm gonna uh, um, record my lightest lights first because those are easy to see. Uh, there's a bit of light here. This is very light here. And I do wanna get rid of my drawing lines. So those are just in place as a, a bit of a um, uh, anchor for me there. Now, most of that, that little tool that I'm using, I'm going to send you the link for that again, because I ordered those on Amazon and I absolutely love those. I'm using them on this huge pastel that I'm using. Uh, your Tortillon knocks is so hard, it knocks a lot of the pastel or the charcoal off. And these little blenders have a little spongy cushion and they're not a material that pulls it off. They really blend really well. And I think I got a big pack of a hundred for like less than $10. And so I'm using them over and over with the black and white because you can use one side for black and one side for white. So I'm going to send you that link. Uh, we learned it in our drawing techniques. It's coming right off with this blender. So not. Um, you see, I'm going to move on through. So here's the tortillon for the dark areas because it does lift a lot of the dark charcoal off. You don't want to use the point of the tortillon. You want to use the side of it as much as possible. And you'll see me uh, picking up the charcoal and using it in other areas, like almost like I've deposited the charcoal and I'm using it as a little palette, a pool of color. Um, I don't want to make you watch all that. Here I go with the little mono zero eraser. Love If you don't buy anything at all, buy yourself that little mono zero. Pop up eraser, this mono zero that has a, a small detailed um, tip so that you can really get in here and begin to draw with that and correct some of these lines. I like this as one of my favorite tools. It's about $5. You can get it on Amazon or at any art store but it's a great tool. You can also use the kneaded eraser in areas like this where I got the charcoal too dark and you can just stamp it. Some people like to use the museum uh, sticky tack and that'll also do it. You can just lift some of that off so it's not quite so dark. And then come back in here with your eraser and start to correct these lines. So watch your angles, because we're always misjudging angles, and drawing is about matching angles, plumb lines, proportions of length. So constantly uh, pay attention to those things. Use your tortillon to draw with to get these, these shapes in here more accurately. Spread this charcoal around. That's the beauty of the charcoal is that you can deposit it in areas and then spread it around. Now my, my background is so dark over here that that will help a lot in getting, I only see a little piece of this ear over here. So I could go ahead and mass in this background here. And this is really gratifying to do this. Use your divine charcoal if that bothers you. Um, it'll fill in, it's softer, so it'll fill in a lot quicker. And immediately, see I have a white side for this blender and a dark side. Immediately, look at how that good Yay! that feels to get that. <laughs> I Oops, love I that part. The ear up. I can get it back. So very quickly, you can establish your range of values here. And start to feel better about uh, a drawing that began really messy and felt like it was out of control. 
adjusting my angles here. And all the way around. Continue to do that as you work your way around. It's quite dark over here. And suddenly that gray value becomes just about right. Again, I love these little blenders. They are really nice. They have a nice um, surface to them. They're not like um, the paper. They blend really smooth, the paper blenders, which tend to bend the paper sometimes if you work on them or push too hard. So see, that's already helped to establish this side of the head. So I know where I'm going. It's a little bit lighter on this side. So I could just come in here now and put a little bit of that in there. Start to get an idea where I'm going on this side of the head. Get rid of my drawing lines because my goal is you don't see any hard lines on this head. You want to get rid of those. Outlines, I should say. There are hard edges. So if you don't have this, you can use a, a tissue. You could use, um, there's lots of different things you could use. You can use the, the tortillon to blend with. Just use the side of it like this. Now you can use the other end of your tortillon to blend the white. And then you can heighten that more towards the end. But it does help right off the bat to get your lightest light in and your darkest dark, and then begin to work on the rest of the values. Um, this whole plane is pretty light. This is pretty light here. This is very light here. Not as light as up here. This is probably the very lightest right here. Okay, so I'm gonna finish this later, but I've shown you the technique. I've shown you how to get started in a few little areas. I can work on this for an hour or two hours. I'm not gonna record that much video. I'll come back to you and show you uh, just continuing this process, more of how I've developed the drawing. Uh, you can come back in here and check for your for more planes. The more planes you can carve out, the more information you have for shading, and the better and more accurate your drawing is going to be, the more dimensional it's going to be. And I promise you, the very first time you work on a portrait, you're going to remember these planes. They're very important, and they really do make a big difference in your drawings. All right, so this is just my sped up version. You see how gratifying it is to put that dark in and just mass it in big and fast and just take a blender, but it really helps the head pop forward. It so helps another you define thing to it. look for is there are variations within all of these planes. So that each plane is not one solid value. You have lightest light right here. So you could come back in there with your, your lightest light, your whitest white. And really sharpen that up. And I got this angle wrong. It goes almost to think about the hands of the clock. Two o'clock. There we go. And I can come back in here. And this this value in the top of the head here is not. You can also make yourself a little pile of of uh, charcoal on a card like this and then dip your, your blender. Let's see, one is white and yeah. Dip it in like this and then deposit a little bit so that you can adjust the values within the range. You can do that with the white, you can do that with the, the black charcoal. This one is darker up here and it gets lighter as it moves over. And because I wanna get rid of the, the drawing lines, you can also use thicker charcoal if you want to. I want to go ahead and outline. And then move out from that outline so I can shade that background area and lose my drawing lines. 
come back in here with your tortillon. Sometimes the tortillon is so uh, hard and strong that it'll knock a lot of your color off, but that's okay. We don't want it to be too black anyway. We just want to lose the drawing line. All right, that's finishing it up. You see that I don't really finish it up. It's not really great. I didn't get to a place where. Uh, and this is I the best done. way to work here with I no drawing done. lines, with just bumping um, a value, a, a shape that's got value to it up next to another shape that has value. Use my little card, come down in here, deposit a little bit of a darker gray right in here. Or come over here, when you're working on this background, move over into this area and put your darks. Um, I would suggest that you don't use acrylic paint. I did um, a planes of the head with acrylic and it was, I had to work so fast. It was a challenge. You can do it, but it's a challenge, I'll tell you. All right, so there, I, you can kind of see me finish it up. This is, I had to turn the lamp on because it got dark. So look how yellow the light is, but, um, that was kind of my just continuing develop, continuing to develop. And you see, see, I still have lots to do on it. Um, final analysis. I don't really like that paper. I knew I didn't, but it's what I had that was gray. Um, I, I do like the acrylic painting better. I feel like I got nice, smooth transitions on my value. So I did this a long time ago. Uh, I don't have a lot of middle tone on this. I have really, really darks and really, really lights and not enough middle tone. Had a strong lamp on it. So, um, you know, just try some different things. Try this with paint. Try it with pencil. Try it with um, charcoal. Do a smaller head if you want to. Do a part of the head. Just do the eye if you want to. Um, it's a wonderful exercise. I promise you it will, it will, whether it looks beautiful when you're done or not, it will help you so much when we start to work on a face to remember all these planes and to slow yourself down and see all the different shapes next week. Um, on the rest of these lessons for the month, you are welcome to work because I'm going to give you some exercises that you can do with drawing and I'm going to give you some color exercises. So you can do some eyes if you want to with, you, you can use colored pencil, pastel pencil, paint, uh, I've got some great demos for quick eyes that we're going to watch and we're going to, you know, look at the different parts of the eye and talk about placement and lots of interesting things uh, with each of the features. So you're welcome to work in color in any um, medium that you wish to work in, give you some uh, detailed critique on it. Denise, jump in there. Well, I did it as you worked and uh, I was very successful because it's not quite as horrible as the last one I did. <laughs> Yay! But still not good. <laughs> Thank you for that honesty. And I, you know, that's what you go in some of these workshops and classes and everybody's appearing. They might have had a lucky day and it looks great. And they, it, you think, oh my gosh, I just can't do this. I, I need to be able to be perfect the first time. So I love it. I love the honesty. I love even though I hate it, my demo should be perfect. I'm showing you my mistakes. You know, I did it wrong. I said it wrong. And that's just, that's what we do. That's the reality of it, Denise, yeah. This is like trying to put a 5,000 piece puzzle together in a short period of time. It is, <laughs> Carol, you, you agree. It's hard and, and I wanna and tell you. When you don't get the pieces right, it doesn't even look human. And it I've doesn't. done that, but you know, this time was a little better. It's so, so true. Um, and it's, it, yeah, go ahead, Carol. Is there another paper you would recommend other than the Strathmore Gray? Yes, um, the, the Strathmore 400 series is a smoother paper. Mm -hmm. um, I use Canson paper a lot. And if I'm using the Canson for pastel, I flip it over and I use the smoother side. The toned gray, is that pretty smooth, Denise? 
It's very smooth. Okay. A little, a little too smooth, actually. But that this would is be better. The 400 series toned gray. Yes, okay. that would be better. Amazon. Great question, Carol. And um, I just grabbed gray and I wasn't thinking and I was trying to do a demo really quick. So, um, you know, we just do the best we can, but it's a good learning tool. So, I've, Jackie. I've been, I've been um, while you were talking, I was trying to find those flat blenders on Amazon. And I didn't, I didn't see them. So what's the exact? Them. Yeah. They're for, they're made for um, uh, electronics. To, my husband uses something similar on his reel-to-reel -reel tapes and his stereo decks and he puts alcohol and cleans in there. Oh, so they're, okay. they're not made for art. Oh, they're, okay. they're made for electronics and computers and things. So um, I'll find them and send the, that link to you. And so um, it's like a cleaner to clean yes. electronics? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and there's some of them that are different qualities. <clears throat> the, uh -huh. This one was a great quality of the fabric that's over it. I don't know how to describe what it is, but like okay. a makeup blender doesn't work the same. Oh yeah. So like an eyeshadow thing, yeah. you think, well, that'll work, but it really, it's the, it doesn't blend as smoothly as these do. So. Okay. Um, this I'll is going to be the Holy grail. It is. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to go looking for it. I know they're going to sell out of them probably, but anytime <laughs> you find a little tip like that and, and Jackie asked me in the middle of the class, what I used to blend my pastels. I'm going to do a pastel class in 2021 again, because I haven't done one in a while, but I use pastel pencils because they're yeah. hard and I just buy, you know, I just have them, especially for portraits, I'll have like a warm, <clears throat> cheeky one and I'll have a flesh one and a light one and a dark shadow. And I'll just use those pencils to move the softer pastel wow. around on the page or on the board. Uh, Denise, yeah. And the soft blenders work too, but you have to have so many different colors of those. I see, yeah. Okay. The, uh, the little blenders that, uh, the soft or the pan pastel company sales don't buy them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they just shred all the pieces. I the do. sponges are real good, but if you're using pan, pan, well, it doesn't matter if you're using pan pastels or soft pastels. On pastel paper, those little applicators that the pan pastel company recommends just shred it's just a waste of money and i'm anxious to buy these that christy said today right so maybe they won't shred the same with makeup applicators they they will dry rot really quick and you'll go to use them and they just disintegrate in front of you but but for some reason i don't know what these are made out of but they work really really well it's been the best one of the best blenders I've, that i've found and i have all the soft ones i went and bought all those and they work okay uh, D D uh, John David Kassan uses them with charcoal and you've got like a little palette knife shape and they work pretty good for charcoal but if you're using them for pastel um, you have to have a different one for every color and when you pull them on and off they end up ripping and I, it just didn't work too good for me so well when you when you uh, blend you said you use a pencil to blend mm -hmm. what do you do about background when you want to when you want to make things smooth yeah, I have some makeup sponges that I use sometimes oh, okay. um, and they work pretty good. These little blenders would be great. So, and I'm also okay. going to send you a link to one of my pastel demos because I talk a lot about blending on those, my pastel demos on YouTube. Yeah, Denise. Yeah. Um, the pan pastel sponges, the big ones are great for blending background, either charcoal, pastel, anything. But those, their little ones are crummy. The bigger ones are very good. Awesome discussion. Okay. And Thanks, I do, Kim. yeah, and I do have just cheap makeup sponges from Dollar Tree, a whole bag full of them. And they do okay. They, there's, they kind of, um, uh, what's the word? They drag a little bit. Oh, okay. uh, they got a kind of a, a little bit of an oiliness to them sometimes, but, but they work okay for large areas. And I have used those because I'm working on a 30 by 40 pastel right now, but I want to tell you those little, um, I use those little blenders. That's what I use. And I, I also bought the little tiny ones that look like a Q-tip to get in around the eyes and stuff. And they oh, work yeah. beautifully. So you, I bought the assorted pack that has the square ones 
and the medium ones and the little tiny ones. Now, when so, you were talking about the talions, is it called a tatel? I can never say them right. I know, tortillon is tortillon. the French word. Okay, there are some that has a little grip. Let me see if I can show you. Little, those little lines around the ends, but then there are some that are smooth and wait. I don't like the, the, the wrapped ones because they leave a ridge in your paper. I like the solid paper tortillons. Okay. And they say you can um, carve those right. off right? and sand them. I haven't had luck with that, but you can do them and clean them up with, you don't want to put water on them, but you can put sandpaper or oh. you can take a razor and cut them down. They're just not as smooth after you do that, but maybe you cut them down and then sand them. Look on YouTube. There's some videos about, yeah. about yeah. the tortillons and how to use those, but yeah, right. they're, they're cheap too. You can buy a pack of 10 for a couple dollars. Okay. Um, and they're great for blending with as well. Okay. So, okay. Awesome class, you guys. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I know it's so hard to pay attention. I know you almost want to go to sleep, but, um, <laughs> but keep are. coming back. That's what they say in 12 step meetings. Keep coming yeah. back. We got to <laughs> keep meeting, you know, Yeah. And this is yeah. hard. This is hard. So yeah. anyway, I love, enjoy it. love you guys and send me your questions or your, your, uh, images for critique i'm happy to look at those and please let me know if you need them asap okay okay all righty right. have, have a good have week a great week right. you guys <laughs> bye